Good evening and welcome to God Talk. I'm Ray and this evening we're going to be discussing some of the attributes of the King. See you soon. Originally recorded by gospel singer and songwriter Sinatch, the song Waymaker has been a very successful song in gospel music. I find it inspirational because the song is about some of God's attributes. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. And I can tell you firsthand, that is true. And I can't tell you how many times he's been a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, and a light in the darkness in my life. In fact, I am trusting in him for those very things right now. And I'm sure in these times, you are as well.
never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Throughout the Bible, you can put together a list of some of God's attributes. And what are attributes? Again, they are characteristics of his nature. When you look through some of the ancient worldviews, Egyptian, Norse, Greek, and Roman mythologies, and those are just a few examples, you will find that the attributes of their gods were a lot like ours. To put it plainly, they were dysfunctional. They may have had superpowers, but that's about where it ends. They married... They slept around, they became jealous of men and each other. Reading their stories is sort of like a spiritual soap opera. Now, I'm not saying the Bible in some places doesn't have strange stories. It does. But a lot of that understanding is hidden in the culture of the times. And the other thing we have to remember, just because some of the peculiar or bizarre things the ancient Israelites did that are recorded in the Bible doesn't mean it had God's stamp of approval on everything. The Bible, especially the Old Testament, is the story of God's relationship with man, first and foremost the nation of Israel. It is also the story of how God had dealt with the evil of his people and the surrounding nations, yet all the time preparing a way for the world's redemption, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Kings and kingdoms come and go, nations rise and fall, but God is unchanging throughout. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, completely different from any other ancient worldview. In his attributes, you will find him nothing like us. In some cases, you will find us like him as we were created in his image, not the other way around. The first attribute I want to start with is God is eternal. Right off the bat, (laughs) that's a mind blow. It doesn't fit into our brains. As far as I know, any ancient deity of mythology had a beginning. The God of the Hebrew Bible did not. Now, this is a question that regularly comes up for debate among theists and atheists. In an effort to propose the existence of God, the theist will go as far back as the earliest scientific theory of the cosmos and ask the question, well, where did that come from? Whether it be the Big Bang theory or the multiverse theory, it doesn't matter. The theist is insinuating something had to bring all of this into existence. In which the atheist usually responds with, well, where did God come from? Good question. But the answer is nowhere. God always was. We may be able to conceptualize having no end, perhaps living forever, but we can't fathom having no beginning. 
<laughs> I was in a band once called Eternum, which is Latin for eternity. I think we lasted about a year and a half before we split up. <laughs> anyway, the closest person who may be able to imagine this would be a mathematician, as numbers can go both ways in either direction, positive or negative, to infinity. Now, what does that tell us about seeking first the kingdom of God? Well, it tells us that if we're going to seek the king and his kingdom by looking in the box, we'll never find him or it, ever. If you're waiting for science to prove the existence of God, it'll never happen because science can only explore what is inside the box. However, I think science has produced a lot of evidence for the existence of God, but remember, science is only that, science. It is neither for nor against the concept of God. It's up to the interpretation of the scientists, and there are many, many scientists that are strong believers in an all-powerful, eternal creator because of the scientific findings they view as evidence in every area of science. Now, we're going to loop these next few attributes together. God is omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. God is omniscient, meaning all-knowing. And thirdly, God is love. These three need to go together because we need to understand that when he orders something or allows something to happen, these three attributes are crucial factors according to his purpose. In Isaiah 46.10, God says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So breaking this down, he is saying he is all-powerful and all-knowing with and throughout time, past, present, and future. His purpose will not be thwarted and he will do all that he pleases. In other words, there is no one higher he needs to answer to. And that's why we need to bring in the attribute of love. Not that God is loving per se, but that he is love. It's foundational. He's the source of it. You see, when he says, I will do all that I please, if we think God is anything at all like us, we can start to think of him as a narcissistic puppet master that has each one of us on strings. We walk when he wants us to. We dance when he wants us to dance, and we lie down and go to our graves when he's done playing with us all together. Sounds a little more like Greek and Roman mythology, doesn't it? No, no, God is nothing like us. Every decision he has made has always been made out of love, for he is love and cannot go against his nature. Well, you might say if he's love, then he sure allows a lot of things to happen that don't seem all that loving. Now, from our perspective as human beings, I would have to agree with you. But again, that is our perspective. We are not eternal. We are not all-knowing. We have no idea the true amount of evil in this world and the battle that is going on in the spiritual realms. We have no idea what we're up against. As we talked about in our last episode, we don't even know the, the connectivity we have with each other around the globe. You've heard of the butterfly effect, right? Well, you think that's just a concept? <laughs> no, it's real. And God knows the long-term effect on this world and others from every action we do. That is part of being omniscient, all-knowing. We base our opinions, most of our decisions, on our finite senses. What we can feel, touch, see, hear within our time span. We're simply not qualified or equipped to judge God for any decision he makes, even if it seems obscure. Now, another thing we have to consider concerning God's love is it was his will to have a deep, loving relationship with us, with his children. Now, for love to be true foundational love, it needs to have a way for it to to be rejected. I'm going to repeat that again. For love to be true foundational love, it needs to have a way for it to be rejected. Therefore, he creates us with a free will to accept or reject him. If I say I love my wife and then I lock her in an apartment with no outside communication in an effort to keep her faithful to me, is that love? 
<laughs> no, absolutely not. It's not love at all. This is obsession. Well, then you might ask, well, if God is all powerful and could do anything, then why didn't he create us to be free, but still not sin or reject him? Well, the answer to that is because then we wouldn't be free. Apologist Greg Kugel explains it this way. I can take a wire and make a square, or I can make a circle, but I can't make a square circle. It's one or the other. Being all powerful doesn't mean he can do something that is contradictory with itself, or for that matter, against his nature. But however, he did provide a way for those who love him and choose to be with him to escape the consequences of the mistakes they've made in the past. And for the mistakes not to be counted against them. And this was done through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So he did give free creatures a way of overcoming their desires to sin and reject him and to do their own thing. But that's only possible. That's only possible if they, out of their own free will, if us, out of our own free will, choose to accept the gift of forgiveness and salvation Jesus offers them. The king offers us. And then making him Lord of our life, making the king the Lord of our life for only if he is walking with us, a life compliance with the nature of the creator is even possible. You know, there are many more beautiful attributes of God that that we didn't even discuss tonight. He is omnipresent, all present. He's everywhere at the same time. He's immutable, never changing. So he is the moral standard by which all things are measured. He is truth. And we'll get into that one when we talk about Jesus. He's good. He's faithful. He's life itself. Another attribute we'll talk about when we talk about the Messiah. The last one I want to focus on tonight is God is light. You know, in the book of Revelation, when talking about the new Jerusalem, it says the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The king is the light of the kingdom, where there is no darkness, no hidden agendas, no secrets among each other, for all will be brought into the light. Luke eight seventeen. How does it make you feel? Really? To me? Honestly, it's really uncomfortable. I'm not sure I want everyone to know all of my thoughts. But do you know why? Because my thoughts are not always good. In fact, sometimes I'm, I'm quite ashamed of my thoughts. <laughs> it's not that I act on them, but some of my thoughts are not what I would call godly thoughts in the least. Sound familiar? Well, what if we only thought good thoughts? then we'd like everyone to know them because they would be encouraging to one another. But the truth is, the hard truth is, we all feel a little more secure with a certain amount of darkness. On some level, we have grown comfortable with evil. That's the reason why we might look at the nature of God and say, why is he so picky? Why did Jesus have to die? Why can't he just put up with us? We don't see a problem with a little bit of evil, do we? Let's put this into perspective. What if someone knocked on your door and said, hello, I've just been diagnosed with COVID-19. I don't want to stay at your house. What would you say? Even if you were the most loving person, you would at least give them a room and then quarantine them. Why? Because that one person could end up infecting the whole entire house. Well, that's what sin is. It's like a virus. It started with two people and now the whole planet's infected. And it's way deadlier spiritually with eternal consequences than any earthly virus. You see, what we fail to realize is that the little bit of evil we've grown comfortable with And maybe it's just not being quite honest with someone about a small business transaction. No big deal, right? Everybody does it. But that's the same evil that steals, rapes, and murders. The latter happens when that evil becomes more mature and fully grown. 
There are not two different kinds of evil. It's all the same evil. We've just grown comfortable with a certain amount of it. And that's why we need to always be walking with the king. We need to invite the king to live within us because he will shine on the darkest parts of our heart and reveal to us the things that are not quite right. Now, this is a process. This is part of the journey. But we have to be willing. The question is, are you willing? Are you willing to surrender your life to the king? If you are, you can email me anytime, godtalk41 at gmail.com. I'd be happy to talk with you. I'd be happy to guide you. In the meantime, please join me next Sunday at 7.30, seeking the personhood of the king. We're going to start to look at the life of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. Thank you.